I've known you for a long time, and I was thinking one of the biggest changes that I've seen in you as a person came when you got your dog. And I remember you approached it in very Tim Ferriss fashion. You didn't just like, hey, I, like me, like I got a goat one day because we saw it on Craigslist, and we just like went and got it. But that's not for the Tim Ferriss way. Yeah. You were like, you, were ta- you talked to a bunch of people, you read a bunch of books, but you ultimately end up, was it 10 years ago you got a dog? Four and a half years ago. Okay, Maybe five. Like but but it, it's been a, an interesting pivot in your life. Why do you think it, it impacted you so much? I think that there are a few aspects to it. Number one is caring for a puppy, at least if you do it well, takes your attention outside of any type of self-indulgent reflection slash obsessive compulsive rumination. Sure. And as someone who has had a history of depression, which is being stuck in the past, and I think being highly self-referential, I mean, it, it, it depression is, I think, as someone who's experienced it a lot in life, uh, very self-obsessive. Right? Yeah. So when you have something in front of you that requires and demands care, or it's going to pee on your carpet every two and a half hours, like Molly, my dog, it's incredibly antidepressive in that sense because it forces a complete refocus. I also, uh, I think, realized very quickly how absurd some of my reactions are to things or have been historically in the sense that if you have a problem at work, you have a problem with your partner, your spouse, your girlfriend, boyfriend, you can get upset and uh, sort of uh, create an imaginary agenda that they have where they deliberately did A, B, or C to upset sure. you. Sure. But with a dog, that's completely absurd. Like at face value, it's completely absurd, right? So, so all the problems are your fault. It's, your, it's your fault, right? So if, if your dog chews on your shoes, that's your fault. It's a dog and you yeah. left your shoes out. Right. Right. So a big part of, I think, raising a puppy well is making it extremely difficult to make mistakes that then become habits. Right. That's 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 uh, an approach or at least a lens through which you can look at raising a puppy. And if you don't want your dog to develop a taste for chewing on shoes, don't leave your shoes out. Right. Put them on something or in something that makes that impossible. And similarly, peeing in the house. To avoid that, use something like crate training. And so, so I think that when I became, particularly in the early periods of training Molly, upset because she wouldn't follow my instructions, yeah. uh, after an initial period of just getting upset, which I think was my default and has been a default for a long time, anger has been a go-to, um, Emotion, which you know, I think is, I think Krista Tippett once said it's fear shown in public or something like that, which I tend to agree with on some level. Getting upset is fear shown in public? Getting angry. Yeah. Yep. And it's a coping mechanism. Some people shut down, right. some people learn to get angry. I learned to get angry, like when I was, when I was little. So th- doing that, though, with this dog who does not speak English. Uh, was so ridiculous and ineffective that I had to resort to doing other things that, lo and behold, translate to other people and even to yourself, like positive reinforcement. Yeah. Right? I didn't, through sports and coaching and teaching or receiving teaching, had a little bit of positive reinforcement, but not not, not a whole lot. Yeah. And so I've learned to go without it, even though that is unhealthy. Sure. And... Uh, reading about animal training, if you really want to take it seriously, if you look at, say, training marine mammals, like dolphins, you can't get pissed and hit it with a rolled-up newspaper. It doesn't work underwater, and they're faster than you are. So you have to figure out how to use, like, whistles and different clickers and means of marking the desired behavior and then rewarding. Sure. And getting into the habit of providing positive reinforcement, I think, led to me doing that more, I could could still do it more with other people. And like how you treat other people, I think impacts how you treat yourself and sure. relate to yourself. So I, I think that those are all pieces of the puzzle. And then last but not least, uh, feeling unconditional love, although granted giving, Very your, dog, conditional. giving your dog food and <laughs> yeah. treats helps a lot. Yeah. But feeling this love from an animal 
uh, and experiencing that in the absence of language, I think is really powerful. Yeah. As someone, as someone who tends to get tangled in their own inner voice in the form of language, to experience that type of deep, positive emotion and connection without language to trip over has been really impactful for me. Do you think it was, it was sort of giving you something to care about, like to be responsible for that wasn't, there was, there's no, uh, there's no reason to have the dog. Like you have the dog because you love the dog. Do you right. know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. you're not getting anything out of it in the sense of like, sure you have a nice car, you have to take care of the nice car, but, but no. you, you know what I mean? I, I think so. I mean, you, you get a dog because you want a dog. It's in a sense a very selfish act. Yeah. Even though you can adopt and do all these other things as I did with Molly that one would hope have some positive karmic sure. impact, but ultimately you are choosing to have a dog. Right. Uh, similarly, I think having kids is, uh, and this isn't a bad thing, it's not a value judgment, but like it is a selfish decision. Like you have kids because you want to have kids, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember Mike Maples, who's this um, very well-known investor and friend of mine said to me, he's like, rule number one with kids is like they owe you nothing. Like their job is to receive love, not to give you love. Yeah. Because you decided to have the kids. Right. And I think that's true with dogs as well or any type of pet. And for that reason, I do not recommend that everybody get dogs, right? Because I think that for a lot of folks, as I felt for a really long time, I was too sort of self-focused slash obsessed. And the only way I could see having a dog was to kind of wedge it into the open spaces that were left over once I had already sure. executed on everything else I wanted to execute on yeah. or fixate on. And when I ended up getting Molly, I made the decision that I was going to actually reverse that and get Molly, prioritize really taking good care of her, and then fit everything else around the dog. Right. And that's, those are two fundamentally different ways to look at it. And uh, I think if you look at sort of the realm of behavior in humans and dogs, like most animals, including humans, are poorly trained. Yeah. And to do it well takes a lot of effort and consistency. So if someone's ready for that, then I, I suggest you know, adopting ideally. But otherwise, I've, I've seen people who, who get dogs and then just neglect them. Sure. Uh, and I'm conflicted as to how to feel about that. Because on one hand, if they're rescuing a dog from a kill shelter. Probably better. Yes. Probably better. One could argue that's better. But I don't know. I'm not, um, yeah, I'm no professional ethicist, so. No, there's a, <clears throat> there's a thing David Brooks talks about when his son was born. Someone sent him an email and said, this is his first kid, they said, you know, like, welcome to unavoidable reality. And the idea being that up until, your, up until then, sure, you have responsibilities with work and life, but like pretty much anything you don't want to have to put up with, you don't have to put up with. Right, yeah. But as soon as you take on something like that, yeah. like with a kid, it's like, you think, okay, I'm going to go to this thing at 1 o'clock. But if your kid falls asleep at 12.59, yep. you're going to the thing when your kid wakes up. Yep. And I think dogs have an element of that too. Suddenly you're responsible for this thing that is totally dependent on you. No. And the dog decides what the schedule is, not you. Which, if you're successful or self-absorbed, and they're kind of the same thing in different yeah. ways, it forces you to pivot your reality yeah. in a way that makes you a better person, I think. I think so. And you develop, I don't, want to, I, I, I don't really want to use the word patience. I think it's something else, maybe greater self-awareness and resilience in the face of the unpredictable. It's equanimity is what I think Equanimity, it is. Yeah. yeah, equanimity we could use. Because it's like, all right, Molly gets sick. I'll give you an example like... I remember one morning I woke up to the, like the most awful stench imaginable at like four in the morning. Right. And I'm very protective of my sleep. Historically, they're like one of the best ways to get me really spun up and upset is to like negatively affect my sleep. Okay. And it's like four in the morning, went to bed at one. Yeah. And it's the most horrible stench you can imagine. I wake up, I turn on the light, and Molly has just shit everywhere in the bedroom, right. including on the wall, which yeah. I thought was very impressive. I'm like, of course. what possesses the dog yeah. to shit against the wall? I don't know. 
nonetheless, it's like, all right, this is like this is what you're dealing with for the it's next unavoidable reality. Hour, yeah. two hours is right. putting on your hazmat gear and dealing with this. And um, I think you develop, or I have developed uh, to some extent. I don't think I'm the best at this, but the ability to put my better put myself in other people's shoes. Sure. Because in a situation like that, it's clear to me Molly doesn't want to do what she's doing. Right, right. There's something. She did not this, do this to ruin your sleep. She, she did not yeah. do it to ruin my sleep, and uh, it's it's it, it's not just unhelpful, but it's damaging to lose your lose your. I was going to say lose your shit, sure. but to get really upset in a situation like that, uh, it it sure. actually makes it harder to train your dog effectively. So the unavoidable reality piece, I think, is, is, a, is a big part of it. And I think there's something to be said uh, for uh, a phrase I heard recently, this scientist I've come to know really well, when he had his first kid, and he had his first kid pretty late, by his standards, right? Yeah. He's a lot older than yeah. I am, so I'm, I'm like an 80-year-old when it comes yeah. to possible procreation these days. but. He said his brother, who had a few kids at that time, said, oh, welcome to the human race. Like yes. When his first kid was born. Sure. And I do think that it doesn't need to apply to everybody, but there, there is a certain uh, self-absorption that is encouraged and fostered in modern life that I think is relatively new. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, mm-hmm. because we're... Even in a densely populated city, you can be very physically isolated, uh, and you don't have responsibilities or things to care for that w- that for the vast majority of our evolution would have been commonplace. Right? You don't have totally. to, like you're not having kids yeah. at like 19 or you don't 18. live with your your grandparents. Right, you don't live with your grandparents. You're not not hunting together, hunting and gathering. Yeah, uh, we're Dogs would certainly have played a role and mm-hmm. did play a role. So I, I think that in some way, having a dog or having a garden or having kids, these are all things we've evolved, sort of co-evolved with. Totally. And in the absence of that, you develop a lot of neuroses, which I was sort of the poster child for for a really long time and probably still am on some level. But less so. No, I, th- I think that's really interesting. The idea of like sort of consciously developing empathy yeah. is, and, and, and how almost you could argue that the way society is set up now consciously stunts the development of empathy. Like, like the, the famous one, you're like, oh, you hear someone, I was like, how was your flight? And they're like, oh, it's terrible. I sat next to this like crying baby the whole time. Then you have kids and you're like, you get on a plane, you hear a crying baby. You don't go, oh, there's a crying baby. This is bad for me. You go, that baby is upset. Like it literally never occurred to you yeah. that the baby was crying because there's something wrong with the baby and that this isn't fun for the baby, right? Or and it's definitely not fun for the parent. Like they don't want it. So it's like I think with dogs too, you like you hear dog barking, you, you like you hear about those you're like, "Oh, I've been through that." Or, "Oh, that's not fun for you." Yeah. It sort of forces you I think that's what they mean by that idea of welcome to the human race, not welcome to the human race you now have con- like, may, you, you know, you're reproducing. It's welcome to the human race. You're no longer, like, a lone wolf. You, yeah. like, understand, like, how... You understand what everyone else has been dealing with while you've been self-absorbed this entire time. Yeah. It's sort of, also like, welcome to the human slash hominid condition yes. that was the norm for, right. like, millennia. Yes. Has been the norm. And, like... Thank God you've snapped out of your aberrant, strange behavior that is totally. really kind of a new luxury. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Did you have you felt like moving to Austin has has had an impact on you in a in a similar way? Like I, I feel like that there is also something selfish and strange about the New York life or the San Francisco life or the LA yeah. life that I've just experienced the South and, and, and Texas and it being a little bit different. Yeah, well, Texas, the South, and Austin are all a little different. A but, little different, but yeah. I, I understand what you mean. Uh, I think that um, Austin has been so far, let's call it three years in, three, four years in, however long it is, has been uh, very refreshing and rejuvenating in part, and this is coming back to your point, 
about our uh, observation about New York and LA and so on, in part because there is no one mono conversation. Yeah. And that could be seen as symptomatic of a huge benefit of living here or a huge drawback. Meaning there's certain there's certain locations in the world like New York for finance. In New York you have finance. Yeah. True in other places too, say London. If you want to be in the NBA all-star game of finance, yeah, it behooves you to go to one of those sure. places. And as a result, it attracts people who are highly driven in certain fields, whether that's fashion, finance, and so on. And uh, as you've mentioned to me before, I think it's th- there's a high correlation between self-absorption and professional success yeah. on some level. It has to be. And if you look at Los Angeles, even though Los Angeles is a huge, in reality, combination of different cities, entertainment is the the predominant mono conversation. Whereas here in Austin, you have um, more of a medley. Yeah. And for that reason, I find it... I find that I don't overtax a single sort of conversational track or part of my brand. Like you can quite easily hop from lily pad to lily pad and maintain some degree of um, mental dexterity, emotional dexterity. There's just there's just more to easily dip your toe into here, yeah. and it does exist in a place like San Francisco, sure. uh, but it takes more effort to avoid the mono conversations. And don't you think one of the downsides of the mono conversation is also, let's call it mono thinking, right? So I think I think we have tended these days to define diversity as merely a function of race yeah. or, or gender, but I think diversity as far as lifestyles, thinking, careers, interests, you know, is, is also super important. The main downside of the mono conversation is mono thinking and uh, a group think that produces an echo chamber that at least in my experience doesn't stress test a lot of your own beliefs because you end up succumbing to this preaching to the choir yeah and that i think is um i think it's very dangerous yeah. I think it's very dangerous. I think in Silicon Valley where you have so much capital and so much power, so much culture shaping technology that uh, you really want to have, not necessarily a court jester, but someone who can poke fun at the status quo and yeah. challenge deeply held beliefs, or I should say better yet, deeply assumed beliefs. Yeah. And that is very increasingly difficult to do in the Bay Area yeah. and in much of, uh, certainly, culture in the United States. Uh, and we're in Austin, yeah. which is jokingly referred to as the blueberry and the tomato soup. Yeah, uh, right? yeah the, the, the blue dot and the red ocean. Yeah. yeah. And so, so it, it, it is a one might think that Austin is just a smaller version of San Francisco, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you do have a commingling of sort of political, artistic, and financial interests yes. that I deeply enjoy. And the, the ability to easily, for instance, I mean, we, we're, we're sitting here right above a restaurant called Jeffrey's. And next door is Josephine House. And I had dinner at Josephine House with someone, I won't mention by name, um, most people wouldn't recognize him, but an extremely successful uh, investor, financier, who uh, came in from out of town, came in from elsewhere in Texas, very well educated, extremely smart, and also a sort of staunch, Republican on many levels, not all levels, right? It's easy to paint with that broad brush. And when you have the ability to sit down with someone like that easily here, it becomes harder to do what is so frequently done in 
San Francisco as a place where I yeah. spent a lot of time, you know, almost two decades in the Bay Area, to say, oh, right wingers are all knuckle dragging idiots. Yeah. It becomes much more difficult to paint. Because you know by direct first-hand experience that that's not true. It's not that, it's not true in many cases, and it's just not that simple. Right. Right. It's just not that simple. And it forces you to contend with, I think, a mess of reality that it behooves all of us to recognize as messy. Yeah. It just requires more thought. Uh, but I, I like the fact that it's it's not as easy to kind of divide this country into like a left-right civil war. Yeah. Of smart versus dumb, rich versus poor, this versus that. It's not that it's not as easy to do here, and and I like that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I also think that it would be difficult for me to live in many places outside of Austin in Texas. Sure, right, which is not a slight against uh, Texas. It just means that Austin has a combination of factors. It's the combination of factors that makes it interesting to me, and the fact that it has some of the ingredients, and we'll see if this backfires over time. It might, but. Uh, that made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley. You have yeah. uni- you have large, famous research universities with world class talent from dozens of countries around the world, and and it attracts a very intellectual crowd. Yeah. And as you and I know, I mean, there is an incredible writing scene here. There's some yeah. fantastic writers, mm-hmm. and uh, it it. It has a lot of the ingredients I like about Silicon Valley without the sort of smug yes. self-satisfaction that I find so unappetizing. You know what I think is important when I was sort of like thinking about places to live is like you're naturally a competitive person, the sort of keeping up with the Joneses part of it. Like it's very easy for life to become an arms race, right? And when you live in a place with more diversity, where you live where there's not sort of one industry or one scene that dominates all the others, yeah. you become more inwardly focused on what you want to do and what's important to you rather than going, oh, did you hear what so-and-so just got? Yeah. Or, you know, like, you, and I think that's a healthier way to live also. Yeah, that's, I think that's a very good observation. There's no one lead dog to follow. Yes. Right? And... As a result, you have to make more conscious decisions about who you might want to emulate. It's not an immediate default. Yeah. Uh, and I like that. I also don't know if Austin would be the right place to live. It probably wouldn't for many industries if you are in your 20s and looking to cut your teeth yeah. and make your mark and kind of summit the mountain. Sometimes you need that to drive you forward, but that maybe isn't how you want to spend your whole life. Yeah, I think that there's a point, at least there was for me, where you've you've basically alternated between park and sixth gear, and yeah. you're like, oh wait, there are five other gears. Yeah, I don't actually need to have this binary lifestyle that is either like rest and recover or full out sprint for the Olympic gold medal. There are actually all of these gears in between that allow you to experience and enrich life in myriad other ways that were I geographically located in one of these no-holds-barred type A cities, I probably wouldn't give myself the slack in the system to discover. I would like to think it doesn't matter where I am. I can cultivate all these amazing habits and types of awareness that will allow me to blah, 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 blah. But the reality is uh, I'm highly flawed with all sorts of predispositions and I am to my benefit and often to my detriment highly, highly competitive. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm thrown into any game, even if it's a stupid game that I shouldn't participate you in, win. I'm gonna win. I'm gonna want to win. And recognizing that uh is important. I, I, I remember having um, Peter Thiel on the podcast long ago. I've listened, yeah. Yeah, and I believe, I don't remember the context exactly, but one of the questions, and I'm paraphrasing here, I believe one of the questions he asks himself is, in what areas of my life can I be less competitive yeah. 
to be more satisfied or more content. Yeah. And if your default is competition, uh, I think it pays huge dividends to be aware of that and to ask those types of questions. My favorite line from him is that competition is for losers. Competition is for losers. No, but I, I think what is interesting about you, though, is you are a very competitive person. And yet, and this is something I wrote down to ask you about, you have a habit of walking away from things that you're at the top of, right? So, like, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your decision to sort of stop angel investing or stop actively angel invest coincides with their decision to move to Austin or the overlaps? Yeah. yeah, very, very much an overlap. Yeah, 2015 and then shortly thereafter. So, so how how much, what, what I'm, I'm curious about your decision to sort of, you know, you're, you're not putting out a book a year, even though you could make a lot of money and sell a lot of copies, you, you sort of have, have sort of been disciplined about what you don't do. But how much of that is also related to like designing a life or a, a day-to-day reality you know how much are how much are they connected? I, I think they are all really interrelated, and I'm not going to try to fabricate some grand master plan because yeah. I don't have one. But I do think that I tend to pause and try to reflect and ask a lot of questions when I feel that my decisions in any area of my life begin to bleed into fear of missing out or scarcity or fear-based decision-making. Not perfect, but in the case of angel investing, and the reason I stopped effectively all of it in 2015 or so is that I realized the conditions were becoming more difficult to place effective bets, especially as an individual using their own capital versus a fund with, sure. a, with a nice like 2% management fee and 20% carry when you're using other uh, limited partner money, which is a fine model. Sure. It's, it's, I don't have an ethical issue with it, but I, I realized that to do a good job with an increasingly uh, increasingly high number of decks in the blackjack yeah. game yeah. in the form of bloated terms, higher prices, uh, f- foreign capital flight from places like China coming into the U.S. and affecting terms. I would either, I could no longer do an effective job part-time. Yeah. And that I, if I wanted to continue to compete in that game, I would need to create a fund, do it semi-full-time. And in that world, I would be effectively replaceable. I would be in a long line of people trying to do the same thing. And that my drive to do that would be predominantly driven by fear of missing out and a, I think a a sort of cortisol driven scarcity mentality that is really fostered in the world of startups. Sure. even if I were to win that game, I felt like the toll it would take would not be worth the sort of Faustian bargain. And yeah. in other words, from a mental health perspective, from a physical health perspective, from an emotional health perspective, that that it would uh, it would it would end poorly. And I tried to do uh, to make a realistic assessment of my track record in angel investing, which has been very good to date, but a lot of it's on paper. Yeah. And I began investing around 2008, 2009. I was like, okay, so if we flash forward, that's about six years. Many of these bets, and uh, the, the the jury's not out until the final Until the wire outcome, transfer comes in. Until yeah. the wire transfer comes in. And that final outcome for many of the startups that you bet on will take seven to 12 years. Yeah. So looking at that timeline, I thought to myself, well, I've placed between 50 and 70 bets. I'm not yet convinced that I'm good at this. So why would I commit to doing this full time if I'm not yet fully satisfied that I am good at this? Right. Or that things are sufficiently influenced by elements under my control that I can help steer outcomes. Yeah. Right? You could be the best at picking the initial horses, but by the end of the race, if they're falling apart, it doesn't make a difference. So these were all questions I thought about. And uh, that 
in addition to many other things, a very close friend of mine asking me to please not stop writing. Yeah. This is Kamal, Kamal, yeah. Kamal Ravikant, great guy. Given the feedback that he'd seen at events with uh, readers of mine, he said, you'll never have that impact investing. Right. So please don't stop writing. And those all then coincided when I asked many of those questions, which were uncomfortable because I've done very well financially in yeah. investing. I've done better in investing by far than I have in writing. And well, certain very, fields are more lucrative than other yeah, fields, Yeah, certain right? fields. So like, not all yeah, success yeah, is created equal. Yeah, for sure. And if you're, if you're trying to get rich, when people are like, I'm just going to sell a few million copies of books, I'm like, <laughs> God bless you, good luck, because that is a really, yes. it's difficult to make that math work. Yeah. There are far easier ways to make money. When I began to ask those questions, I realized that much of my being in the Bay Area was predicated on maintaining and building a competitive advantage in investing. So right. if you remove the investing Why am I here? and you look at your surroundings with fresh eyes, you're like, well, wait a second. A lot of my best friends have left, so my social reasons for being here are few to none. Yeah. Not none, but few. If I remove the investing, my professional need to be here is non-existent. Sure. So why am I here? Yeah. What do I like? What do I dislike? And a lot went into the decision, but... Uh, led me to consider a, a number of different places, but predominantly Austin, which I'd wanted to move to right after college, just didn't get the job yeah. Trilogy Software. Uh, and if you look at some of these decisions, they're almost all catalyzed by a breakdown of some type. Yeah. Wearing out, some type of burnout. Yeah. That happened with the... Uh, for our chef leading to podcasting. Yeah. I just flamed out because I tried to do a, what should have been a three or four year project in a year or a year and a half, which was a suicide mission. And that, that extreme pain and burnout then led to test driving the podcast. Right. right. So a lot of my walking away at the top, so to speak, I would like to say is this sort of grand philosophical insight and like balls of steel and you're not looking at the pile of chips and going, I have enough, let's walk away. You're actually going, this is awful and miserable. It's often both. Yes, right. But it starts with this is awful and miserable. Right. So it's sort of the breakdown equals breakthrough. I'm, I'm borrowing that from yeah. someone that is catalyzed by wearing out. Yeah. And I suppose where I've been uh, fortunate or made some good decisions is instead of just plowing through that, sometimes it's physically impossible. Yeah. I will say I have enough chips where I don't need to race into the next decision. Let me take some time to journal, journal, yeah. journal, journal. And I do mm -hmm. a lot of journal, journaling, asking questions. I don't find my thinking to be clear at all unless I'm writing. Yeah. Uh, and I think Kevin Kelly was the one who said this to me, amazing guy, uh, that he doesn't write to put his ideas down. He writes to think. Right? Yeah, he writes sure. as a means of thinking. And in doing that, I then have looked at options like stopping all angel investing. Yeah. Right? I like to ask the, these absurd questions. What if I left the Bay Area entirely, moved to Austin, Texas? And I think that another reason I've been comfortable pulling the trigger on a lot of these things, trying the podcast, is that I view them all as, and I don't know why it seems... I don't know why I find this so easy, but a lot of people find it hard. I, I'm not sure why that is. I think it's practice predominantly. Yeah. Like, what would a, what would a meaningful but reversible experiment look like? That's it. Right. Yeah. Okay. With the podcast, I committed to I think it was six episodes. Yeah. Then if I don't like it, I can walk. That's that's it. And with Austin, it's like you can always I can always move back to the Bay Area if yeah. my realization is oh my god I didn't realize how much I loved. These sure. things I now miss, I can always move back. It's it's completely reversible. I think it's a great because I remember I was asking re you recently for some advice on something. It was like sort of a big purchase. It would be a big lifestyle transition, and you were like, "Well, how else are you going to find out if you want to do it or not?" And you said, "Like, why don't you just commit to doing it for two years?" And and that's totally right because I remember when I dropped out of college, I was it's like I'm dropping out of college. This is the biggest decision I've ever made in my life. Yeah. I remember I went to someone there like, you know, you can go back, right? And it, like, it didn't even occur, like, even when I went to drop out, I was like, I'm here to drop out. And they were like, you li there, there's not a form for that. There's a take a semester off form, you know? Yeah, but yeah, we yeah. think these lifestyle decisions are 
irrevocable mm-hmm. and life altering yeah. and really they can start very small. They can start really small and I want to just highlight something you just said which which I think it's missed oftentimes in the romanticizing about dropping out yeah. of college that for many of the folks who are like the name brand titans who have ado- yeah. who have adopted dropping out of college as uh, one of their favorite stories and uh, drums to beat. If you have the the Zuckerbergs, the Teals, or whoever it might be, although Teal's not a great example of dropping out himself, but yeah. you talk about these incredible icons of entrepreneurship who dropped out of school, it's really important to realize that when you drop out of Harvard or Stanford, Different. those administrations effectively say, come back anytime you want. Yeah. And that is a really important sort of footnote that people need to be. Yeah, although what I would add to that is I actually think the Zuckerbergs and the Gates are proof of the experimenting thing, right? Because I hear from people who want to drop out of college all the time. They're like, I'd like to be an entrepreneur. I want to drop out of college. Mark Zuckerberg left college because Facebook was successful, right? right? Um, he wasn't dropping out of college to then go start the Facebook. Yeah. And so it, you can do the thing now, and then if it's working, you can transition away. Right. You can decide to go, hey, what would it look like if I, if I committed full-time to this for six months? What would come of that? And I think it's not like you'd never been to Austin before, and you sold everything you, you own, yeah, no. and you were like, I'm going to see if I like it. Like you, you can experiment. You, you dip your toe in these things in a bunch of different ways, and then, yeah, you are jumping off a cliff, but there's also an exit strategy. Yeah, I I almost never burn the ships. Yeah. I, I can't think of offhand a single example of me burning the ships and throwing caution to the wind and just yeah. leaping into the unknown. That's just not how I do things. And It's also because you don't need to do them. That, like people, yeah. I think you don't need to do that. It's And, that, and by you, mean, I think mo- that means most people. Like yeah. Most people should not sort of jump head first into the shallow end and hope that they figure it out. I think it's a terrible yeah. idea. And if you look at some of the the entrepreneurs who are thought of as these swashbuckling risk takers, Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, I've had on the podcast, as one example, they're actually, when you peek under the hood and start looking at the details, they are better called experts in risk mitigation and capping the downside. Sure. Yeah. Like he figured out how to lease planes, I think from Boeing, might have been Airbus, for Virgin Atlantic. Yeah. And set up a structure such that the financial risks usually associated with airlines were dramatically mitigated. Yes. And uh, he made a lot of exciting, unusual bets, most of which were survivable bets. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Jeff Bezos says, I don't believe in bet the company bets. Yeah. He's like, I want to be constantly taking risks, small risks yeah. that are survivable. I don't want the, if this doesn't work, we go out of business. Risk. He's like, you've waited too long if you have to take those risks. Yeah. yeah. And as you mentioned with Austin, I mean, I've been to Austin 15 times. Yeah. I had spent increasingly long periods of time here each trip to South by Southwest. So I had, I had already done more than dip my toe in the water. Yeah. And it was really a question of whether I would enjoy living here. I knew I enjoyed being here yeah, right. for short periods of time. Would I enjoy living here, which is a whole separate question. And there are ways to test. Yeah. So I, th- I think my comfort with walking away at the top is a result of a high degree of comfort with and a, a large amount of practice in thinking about my life as a series of experiments. Yeah. And it's it's also just being a student of recent history, right? Look at Dave Chappelle. People are like, he's crazy. He walked yeah. away from 50 million right. or whatever. And then he comes back and he does, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, what, 100, yeah. 100 million dollars with Netflix? Yeah. Dave Chappelle's fine. Yeah, sure. And uh, people who really focus on being good at their craft can almost always come back. Uh, no, one, no one, I can't remember who said this, this was in Tribe Mentors, but someone said, you know, if Will Smith doesn't do a movie for two years, people aren't like, whatever happened to Will Smith? Right, like, sure. Will Smith can take all the time he wants. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think that underscores the importance of just focusing on being as good 
as possible at your craft. Yeah, that's, that's the Cal Newport thing. Like, if you're so good, they can't ignore you. You get yeah. to dictate your terms. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I am extremely risk averse. Um, risk defined as something with a with a high likelihood of an irreversible outcome. Yeah. Like, the, the, the the bet the farm. Yeah. So, do you have any strategies for mitigating? Like, what, if you're thinking about doing something, what do you look at to sort of separate? Good risk and bad risk. Good risk for me has a few characteristics. Uh, Two of the key characteristics would be high, high 90 plus percent likelihood of developing, developing or deepening skills that will transfer to other things. Okay. Whether now or in the future, even if this project fails. Uh, Another characteristic of good risk would be developing relationships that can transcend this project, yeah. even if it fails. And this is borrowing from Scott Adams quite a bit, the creator of Dilbert, who talks a lot about this type of thing, how to win even if a project fails. Another characteristic of good stress would be something that will help me to develop attributes or emotional resilience, uh, or to take things less seriously, which I think often go together. Yeah. Right? To try something that is scary to me or to most people that I can demystify in such a way that it's less intimidating. Yeah. Right? The podcasting and doing six episodes is a great example. Yeah. So in the beginning, the idea of podcasting in my head was having this big studio and all this equipment and it's This American Life with a staff of 40 people. Yeah. And no, it's not. After right. doing six episodes, it's like, oh, all right, actually, I'm not scared sure. by audio at all. Because yeah. These mics, these cables, and the recorder that's on this chair, yeah, are like five hundred bucks, and you're right. locked and loaded. And the editing is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, so those are three characteristics of of good risk, and then uh, bad risk, I think, is largely a function of allowing unknowns that don't need to be unknowns. And so I do a lot of homework for many of my bets. If I'm looking at, say, Austin. Right? I want to understand what the landscape, political, legal, and so on, looks like in Austin. Uh, I want to look at population growth. I want to look at employment growth. Yeah. I want to look at median home costs yeah. and how prices are moving, not just in Austin, but compared to my other options on the table. So the opportunity costs of the decision. It's a relative decision. It's not an absolute decision. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and I'm also going to look at, let's say if I stay in San Francisco, what are, what are the risks of the status quo? Yeah. Like what are the knowns that I dislike? And then what are the possible changes that I might dislike? So not just looking at the, the potential upside and downside and pros and cons of the new option, but comparing it to the current option. That sounds yeah. so self-evident, but it is not common practice, right? Most people just assume, all right, this is my known, and I'm going to look at the risks and pros and cons of this new option. I'm always looking at relative. I'm looking at not just opportunity cost, uh, but the sort of relative attractiveness, right? And that can apply to just about anything. I mean, it can can apply to startups, certainly. Uh, And the... In terms of bad risk, you know, I, I do look at financial risk. I look at reputational risk. I look at legal liability risk. And uh, I, do, I, do, I do more comprehensive risk assessment than I do opportunity assessment, in part because I want to look for asymmetric. Sure. Bets yeah. in the sense that if I know I can cap my downside, that there is little or I can manage or completely eliminate reputational and legal risk by asking for, let's say, an indemnity clause yeah. and having a written record of what we agree my responsibilities will or will not be. And I'm putting in $50,000. Yeah. In a sense, if I can control my time that is allocated to this, my max downside risk is 50%. Right. But if I'm investing in software as a service It's 50000 you mean. Sorry, $50,000. Yeah. If, though, 
I'm investing in a sector and a vertical and a type of company like software as a service or whatever that has comparables which show 100x returns, 1,000x returns, I'll take that bet all day long. Yeah. Right. If the team and so on sure, sure. give it a reasonable likelihood of success, that is a great asymmetric bet. And I think you can do that outside of investing in startups. I think investing helps to hone the questions you ask and the types of lens through which you look at things uh, and how you might consider arbitrage and so on. But like uh, Austin, for me, is a very... Uh, it's a very simple bet where it's easy to cap the downside. It seems to me that's the main strategy in your life is, is capping downside. So it's like, okay, you put $50,000 in a startup, the most you can lose is 50,000. You spend $500,000 on a real estate investment, uh, you're responsible for the cost of maintaining the property. You know, like it, it's a it's a totally different. And so, and I think that that explains your experiment thing. So it's not I'm starting a podcast now. I have to have a podcast forever. You're thinking I'm committing to six. So the most, if the, if I don't like it, the most I have to do is six episodes of something I don't like. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're yeah. you're you're capping. You're capping. So it's not endless amounts of losses, whether that's time, resources, happiness, money. Yeah. And uh, I always try to cultivate walkaway power with my own projects. How do you do that? Uh, I'll explain or try to explain why I think it's important first. If, if I feel like I have to do something, you lose your optionality. Yeah. Right? And furthermore, you begin to make decisions out of fear or guilt, which in my experience turn out, almost always turn out poorly. Yeah. Similar if you're making decisions out of prestige, can turn yeah. out very poorly. I think I borrowed that from Maria Popova uh, and what she said once on the, po- on the podcast. But cultivating walkaway power is a function for me of A, Revisiting how little you actually need yeah. frequently. Yeah. This uh, is Seneca. Yeah, Seneca, okay. not Timor's Popper's Huts, but yeah. you know, I will set aside a certain number of days each month or whatever it is to get by with the scantest, scantest or scantiest, I always mess that up, affair. But practicing periods of poverty or. Uh, it's like making, knowing, being okay with a rock bottom. Yeah, making, so making not, do. Yeah. I just did this last week. I'm making do for a while with just like instant coffee and like oatmeal in a bag that you cook with yeah. boiling water. Yeah. And everything's great. And granted, it's, it's different when you do it for an extended period of time. It's different if that's your only option. Sure. But nonetheless, yeah. constantly revisiting and confirming how little is actually needed is number one. Uh, number two is doing uh, fear setting, this exercise that I talk quite a lot about, which is, of, of course, borrowed yeah. directly from stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also largely based on yeah. stoic philosophy of, um, what is the term in Latin? It uh, is meditating. Med- oh, meditatio malorum. Yeah, yeah. meditatio malorum meditating on the, the possible evils or risks. So I have a written format, fear setting. People can check out tim.blog forward slash TED if you want to see what that looks like. It's all free. I do that routinely. So we're recording this in January 2020. And I did a lot of fear setting around... Us s- talking, how, how poorly this How go. poorly <laughs> this conversation with Ryan could go and how I would possibly repair the <laughs> incredible reputational damage. Uh, around stopping just about everything. So even though I'm not seriously considering nor do I feel compelled to say stop, stopping the podcast, yeah. right? I would write down like, stop the podcast, question mark. What if I stop this? What if I stopped yeah. all involvement with real estate? What if I stopped all travel? Sure. What if I stopped, and I'll, I will go through the thought experiment of what if I completely stop these various things categorically? And when you run through the kind of so what, so what, so what, so what, for yeah. each of those, 
ultimately you realize you're going to be fucking fine yeah. with all of them. Sure. And to that extent, I think that making good decisions is often negotiating with yourself. Uh, and that the person you want to have win that negotiation, and this is advice I got a long time ago, is the person who cares the least. And that's not a value judgment. But if you have two people negotiating against each other and one feels like they have to do the deal yeah. and the other person has a has 20 different BATNAs, right? Best alternative to negotiated agreement. And they don't give two shits whether the deal happens or not. Or at the very least, they're very comfortable walking away. Yeah. He or she who cares the least wins. Yeah. And... I, I like to cultivate the side of me that can see how little a lot of the glossy veneer aspects of life uh, add at the end of the day to like the core of what you need to feel content on a regular basis. Um, so that might be a, a lot of word salad at once, but th- those are at least some of the ways that I think about it. No, I think that ties into, we were just talking about the Stoics. Marcus really says this thing. He says, like, ask yourself at every moment, is this necessary? Like, yeah. what you're thinking, what you're doing, what you're desiring, is this necessary? And that seems, you used to have a sign in your house that said, like, simplify. Still have it. Yeah, yeah that seems like you guys are in alignment. You're like, how, do I need this? Do I want this? What would happen if I didn't have it? Why does everyone else want it? It seems like you're constantly questioning that. I am. Uh, uh or I try to do it at regular intervals. I mean, I get caught up in the slipstream yeah. and start swimming against the riptide all the time. Sure. I mean, I get sucked into stuff all the time. But I do very frequently take plane rides and so on to journal. And to also try to identify, this is relatively new, I mean, in the last few years, but especially crossing 2020 and looking at not just 2019, but the last decade yeah, and the better decisions that I had made and the poorer decisions uh, that I'd made, which are, which are different from good and bad outcomes. Right? Yeah. There's like, the, right. but just the, so where I made mistakes in decision-making and some of the, the sort of, catastrophes and things that really caused me a lot of angst and upset. Uh, one of the corollaries is I to the bad decisions is that, or correlations rather, is that I, I wasn't paying attention to energetic management or like energy management and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Oh. So it's, it's You're pretty, managing your own energy? It's, yeah, it's pretty yeah. simple. I mean, as I get older, I still feel like I'm in good shape, yeah. but if I don't sleep well for two or three nights, yeah. life is not good. Right. Generally. Right. And that, that's a really simple example, but the, the point being when I'm considering doing a project, partnering with someone, embarking on some type of uh, creative endeavor, the, the question that I'm trying to ask myself now is w- over the intermediate or long term, which to me could be you know, three months. Yeah. Uh-huh. Will this give me more energy or take away or deplete me of more energy? Sure. And so it's not like the hell yes or hell no. It's like, what does this do to my energy levels? Yeah, which are which are closely related, but it's but yeah. some of, some of the things that give me a lot of energy are not necessarily a hell yes. Right. They're a yes, like swimming regularly. Yeah. This it, is a great town for that. It is a great town for that, yeah. Yeah, you love Barton yeah. Springs. Yeah. It's a great great location. There are a lot of pools here. Uh, so swimming regularly, I always feel better and I always feel more energized. I feel more emotionally resilient. Sure. After swimming. Yeah. And it's not a, a hell yes, like, for some people going to Burning Man for the first time or something. Right. It's, it's not sure. that volume. It's not like it's, chocolate cake, hell yes. No, it's of course, not that, I want it's, it's yes. not that volume of yeah. like jump up and down on the table, hell yes. But it is a great investment for uh, building up energy reserves. Yeah. 
And so I've tried to make more and more decisions keeping that in mind. Yeah. And uh, I've turned down a lot of what on paper would look like fantastic opportunities because it will involve dealing with a huge bureaucracy, which I know is going to drain my batteries and historically has always drained my batteries. And it's like, you know, it's a, it's, it is on paper a great opportunity, but this is going to take 10 times longer yeah. than it's spec'd out to take. And it's going to be draining. And I, I would much rather do something smaller that doesn't have that effect on my energy, even though one could argue that this would be better for my career, whatever the hell that happens to be. I still don't know what the... What I think I, that's... I think a lot of people... You were talking about the difference between good and bad decisions is not the same as good or bad outcomes. And so I think a lot of people make decisions, and I, I do this, uh, but I have to counteract it, but we go like, is this going to make me more or less money? Is this going to make me more or less famous? Is this going to make me more or less successful? Is this going to make me more or less interesting? We, th- we think about the outcomes. Yeah. And, and often that outcome is very far in the future and very much the, the decision isn't, it isn't like a, if you do this, you are guaranteed X, you know, or you, if you do this, you're guaranteed X. It's like, hey, if you continue to do this over and over again, you might get this thing in 20 years. Yeah. And I think one of the things I took from the four hour work week and that I, I've gotten from you regularly is you tend to think more about like quality of life right now. So don't work a crappy job that you hate so in 50 years you can retire and go to the beach. Yeah. Think about what decisions you can make now that give you the access to the beach mm-hmm. in, the, in the intermediate or short, short term. So I tend to think more like... As an experiment, right? Yes. Specifically. Yes. Because you may get you may hate the beach, to the actually. end of the line and be like, oh shit, I actually don't like sailing. Totally. And this was my made up dream for 50 years for which I sacrificed all these other things. Yeah, so I think it's like, is this giving me like day to day what I like more or less, you know, so that you're, you're, that's my version of the energy thing is like, mm-hmm. am I having the time and the life that I want? Not, am I doing this? So maybe I get that in the future. And it seems yeah. like as a person who popularizes lifestyle design, that's kind of your core message. It's like, are you designing a life you actually like living in? That is, that is a, I think a, a huge piece of it. And if we wanted to parse that out even further, it's, it's really trying to cultivate an acute awareness of knowns and unknowns. Uh, and if you look at lifestyle design, for people who aren't familiar with the term, so lifestyle design would effectively be a contrasting sort of philosophical lens through which to look at career and personal development that is juxtaposed with the the kind of slave, save, retire. I am going to cash in my chips in 20, 30, 40 years that will then redeem this period of doing many things that I dislike doing. Right. Which is not to say you're always going to enjoy doing everything. Yeah. Right? Like I don't know many people who love doing their taxes. Yeah. There are things that you need to do, but and no one gets exactly what they want when they're 20 years old. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you have to right. earn and build and yeah. invest. Yeah, there's a there is a period of uh, testing that goes on to determine where you are particularly adept. Uh, looking at, we, we don't do, have to do a rehash of, of, of the book, but suffice to say, there are ways that you can test the, and should test, the hypothesis that in X period of time, when I do Y, it is going to give me Z amount of pleasure that will make up for these decisions I'm making in the interim. That is a that is a very conting, that is a theory that is contingent on many things being accurate. Yeah. And in my experience, effective lifestyle design is effective testing uh, and awareness. Investing is for me at least, has, has been effective testing and developing keen awareness of things that most people don't pay attention to or a lot of people don't, don't pay attention to. So if we're looking at, for instance, living in New York City yeah. versus living in Austin, someone might say, well, I'm just going to live here for another 10 years. Yeah. I'm going to have these following promotions in my investment banking job and then I'm going to move to Hudson Valley. I'm going to move to Santa Barbara. I'm going to move to, and then live the good life. Sure you will. Right. 
Yeah. So you that if that is your life plan, like let's spend some time developing experiments to prove or disprove that yeah. before you dedicate the next 20 <clears throat> years to it. But people will very often spend more time planning their, their Memorial Day weekend than they will specking out tests. Right. right. So if you look at, so, so A, is there anything in your historical record to suggest that you will be able to walk away from something like that? <laughs> right. Anything. Yeah. If you are type A, right? Yeah. Uh, and by definition, in that circumstance, you're probably type A. Yeah. And uh, there are many, 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 many faulty assumptions. Yeah. Right? So uh, I think that I, ha- I, I am very, very accepting of the fact that there are many things I don't know and there are many things that I take for granted and there are many things that I don't see. Yeah. Therefore, I, tr- I spend a lot of my time developing experiments. And that's, that's my constant framework. Like, how can I be sure that I know X? Yeah. Which you know, relates to, in 2015, walking away from startup investing. So I was like, all right, if I look at the track record of these various companies, not only in my portfolio, but others, for the biggest wins, it's taking, if we're looking at, say, Shopify, Uber, et cetera, it's taking seven to 12 years yeah. to come to fruition. And your final tally is not known until you've liquidated all of your holdings effectively. I mean, yeah. it's a little more complicated yeah. than that, but not by much. So even though on paper, and also in exits, it would, I could convince myself that I am good at this, and people tell me I'm good at this. That remains to be seen. Yeah. Right. And so I stopped. Uh, and, and the larger assumption, just because you're good at something, does not mean you have to keep doing it for the rest of your life. Yeah. There are many things I'm good at that I shouldn't do at all. Yeah. And uh, it's. I think it's 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 challenging for anyone, myself included, to shift gears. If you if you're good at something, being rewarded for something, and yet you have this creeping dread that you no longer want to do it, that 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 is a challenging situation yeah. for I think just about anyone, and certainly has been challenging for me. But the the the, the parachute, right? The the safety net is realizing that for almost anything, you can leave and come back. Yeah. Almost anything. And uh, I'm sure there are exceptions, but if we're talking about businesses and professional capacities and careers, if you are really good, that's a big... That's the ultimate leverage. That's, that is, that is a, a huge hurdle that you yeah. need to be able to pass. But yeah. if you are really good and dedicated to your craft or crafts, it could be a combination of, of unusual crafts, right? Right. You might be a quant who's also really good at writing and then you have a newsletter. Sure. It could be an unusual combination of traits like Warren Buffett and public speaking and writing sure. or Jeff Bezos and writing, entrepreneurship, et cetera. You can always come back. Right. Right. It's, so I try to keep that in mind when making a lot of my decisions. You know what's interesting? It's like you're taking it all very seriously, but then you're also not taking it that serious. So like I, I was thinking, because we were talking about the Stokes more, like one of the things that sort of weaves its way through, I think the thinking you're, you're giving, and I know I gave you one of these, but the, yeah. the memento more, like, like part, one of the reasons you shouldn't do the thing for the rest of your life just because you're good at it is that you only get one life. Yep. And one of the reasons I think you're always questioning the, like, it, it seems like part of your fear setting thing is like, what if I die? Like, does any of yeah. this matter? Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, the costs of inaction. Yeah. I think uh, that thinking very carefully about the costs of inaction and telescoping out six months, 12 months, 18 months, you know, what effect does continuing to do what you do have on? you and your loved ones from a financial, emotional, physical perspective, right? Yeah. And uh, I think about death all the time. And it's not uh, a morbid, sullen exercise for me. It, it's, uh, this becomes easier the older you get because friends start dying, family members die, and you realize this is not an indefinite lease. Yes. Like you have... Or that it is a lease. You don't own it. Yeah, it is yeah. a lease. Yes. And that 
having the, I don't want to call it time pressure, but awareness of that impermanence for me, I find, uh, this might sound strange, but like greatly encouraging because it drives a sense of urgency. Yeah. Uh, or at least time sensitivity to a lot of my decisions. And uh, so that's on one hand, sort of prizing this fleeting, yeah. non-renewable resource that is time and realizing that it doesn't matter how much money you're willing to pay on your deathbed, you're not going to be able to buy back more time. Right. And then simultaneously, uh, I guess meditating is the best way to put it, or contemplating how little a lot of this matters or all of it matters yes. in so much as, you know, as Naval Ravikant once said to me, he's like, yeah, we're just a bunch of monkeys on a spinning rock mm -hmm. and, uh, spending time, this is going to sound so highfalutin, but whatever, reading about the cosmos or contemplating as, uh, I believe it was Ed Cook, an incredible, uh, memory competitive champion. And, uh, entrepreneur, memorizes his company, uh, M-E-M-R-I-S-E, -E, and coach, also writer, had said to me, you know, he would, and BJ, BJ Miller, who's a hospice care physician, I think did something very similar, but they would look at, say, the stars and imagine that it's possible, and I'm not an astrophysicist, yeah. so maybe this isn't possible, but that it's possible that the star you are seeing is in fact light that is hitting your eye from a star that no longer exists. Yeah. Right. right. And to just sort of contemplate that when yeah. you're freaking out because you have some problem with Amex. Right. Or there's some disagreement and it's like somebody bad mouthed you at work or whatever it is. You're like, right. Okay. To right. number one or number two on the New York Times bestseller list or you know, all the things that who we, cares? Yes. All dust. Right? Yes. As, as our friend Marcus would say, yes. like all dust, like it, nobody gives a shit. Right. Like it's not even all, you in the future yeah. will give a shit. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's all going to be it's just completely irrelevant. And, uh, so, so holding those two in my mind, uh, has been a practice. Uh, and, um, I do think about death a lot and, um, there was, um, person featured in, I think it was Tribe Mentors, Munib Ali, who's involved, uh, very heavily involved with cryptocurrency, a very, very smart guy. I might, I'm maybe better put blockchain, very smart guy. And it's, it's funny to me how certain things stick and certain things don't stick. Yeah. Or certain things have like a time release. Right? So I read this and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And then months later, it sort of resurfaced and I've thought about it a lot since, which was he'll he will routinely ask himself when he's overwhelmed or feeling scattered, you know, how much would I pay to relive this experience like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. And I'm paraphrasing. So yeah. it's not, it's not, not, not perfectly stated, but, and I think about that where I'll be, if I think about the experiences that I would pay the most for, and I'm being honest with myself, it's, it's not the professional successes or the glamour shots. It's usually something very simple. Right. Like it's a moment of stillness and quiet yeah. and peace like and wake, yeah, wake, waking up in bed with my girlfriend on a, like a beautiful sunny day and like patting the, patting the bed and having my dog jump up right. and having a little snuggle fest. It's, it's very, it sounds so cheesy. Like the 20 year old Tim would just be vomiting all right. over himself right now. But nonetheless, 20, 20 year old Tim is pretty miserable. Fuck. So, uh, I feel like I've improved on that front and asking yourself like, all right, if, if I were 80 and like Molly has long since passed away, maybe my wife has passed away. How much would I pay for that? Yeah. Right. And that really, to me is part and parcel of the valuing of time, these slivers of experience as more valuable than making a speculative decision about earning more in the future based right. on doing something that say, takes you away from those people. Right. Or agreeing to something because you might get some honor or, mm -hmm. you know, 
Okay. Okay, I'll just add one more yeah. thing, which is I really think that even if you keep all your money in a mattress, studying good investors is worth a lot. Yeah. Not necessarily in financial return, but in temporal return, right? In, like, in, in, in how you think about time. Yeah. Because humans overall are very sloppy. Uh, I'm no mathematician, so I'll put myself in the same category. When it comes to thinking about probabilities. Yeah. Like probabilistic thinking is not, it's not a strong suit for humans. And uh, so you might hear like, oh my God, there's a room of 300 people and like yeah. these two people had the same birthday. That's crazy. Yeah. But like mathematically speaking, it's not that crazy. Right. Um, and in fact, at some point it becomes totally expected. Yeah. Right. And similarly, developing a basic sort of mathematical literacy with respect to investing, because I think... Uh, most people watching and listening to this will have, as I did, I mean, I stopped taking math in high school because I had one bad math teacher. Even though I was good yeah. at it, I became totally turned off. My brother went on to get a PhD in stats. So, and it was the same year. He had a good math teacher and I had one who was right. just a ball buster. And you can see how we split in different directions. But I've, I have a deep-seated insecurity when it comes to math. Nonetheless, studying, investing has helped me to develop... Uh, my understanding of certain concepts like expected value. So if you think that you are going to, you could make $100,000 or a million dollars or $10,000 at Y point in time, is making that decision in your mind actually worth 10, 100,000 or whatever it might be? Yeah. Well, it depends a lot on the probability of that happening. Right. And then you can do some basic multiplication and be like, all right, actually the expected value of that, given that it's low probability or 50% or 30%, is instead of $100,000, it's actually worth $25,000. Right. That could very, very deeply influence how you make that decision right. about how you're going to spend your time over the next six to 12 months. Right. Right. Sure. Because if there's a sure bet, it's a $50,000 return, but it's 80, 90% likely to happen. It's worth more. It's worth more, right? If you're thinking about it in a structured way. And um, there are some really fun books on investing that don't necessarily touch on this in exactly. One is called um, More Money Than God. It's about hedge fund investors. Okay. It's a super fun book. It's kind of like Liar's Poker, yeah. but instead of purely bonds, it's, yeah. it's all sorts of different characters and types of investing. Uh, there are other books. I think there's one called How to Measure Anything which is worth taking a look at. That was recommended by co-founder of ZocDoc named Nick Ganju, who is a fantastic teacher, really, really good teacher. He's taught me a lot about music and math. Uh, math is too scary. Just like how to think probabilistically. Um, because life is probabilities. Yeah. And uh, whenever, for instance, and I'm, I'm dragging myself into the deep end a little bit here because um, I'm not a scientist, but if you if you look at science and studies, you will very. This is another reason to become sort of probabilistically literate, is you'll be better able to separate fact from fiction and fact from hyperbole in yeah. medicine and science. People get so confused about these things, and people end up dying and making bad decisions, right. and choosing quacky doctors without this basic literacy. There's a, there's a great book called Bad Science yeah. by Ben Goldacre that I recommend to everybody. I, I excerpted some of those chapters in the appendix of The 4-Hour Body because I wow. think it's so important. Um, but suffice to say, if, if someone says, these studies prove X, it's not really true. Right. Like they're, they're, they suggest at a high probability. They suggest for a very small uh, uh, sample size, it had yeah. a slightly uh, greater than average probability yeah. that... Act, yeah. And it, it, it could be an incredibly strong signal, but it is not 100% certainty. Right. So it might never have been replicated. It might but, never have been replicated. There could be experimenter bias. Who knows how tight the design was. And... It changes how you relate to the world and decisions and opportunities and risks when you start thinking in terms of probabilities, yeah. right? Because to remove all risk is a fool's errand. Yeah. Right? I spend a lot of time trying to do that and chasing that tail end of like the last, let's just call it 10% of risk, you could spend all your time, 24 hours a day, every day trying to do that. 
and you would still not succeed, right? You, you just have to lock yourself in solitary confinement in the box, right. and it, it would be no life worth living. But uh, this this has been a real game changer for me. Even though I don't I don't do I mean I invest. Anyone who's alive invests. I think that's right. it, it, you are investing time, energy, capital. Like you're choosing where to allocate resources. Sure. Uh, but uh, I read all these books on investing, uh, or think twice is another one that's good uh, related to cognitive biases. Uh, not because I'm playing the stock market, yeah, at all. Right? That's not why I'm reading these books. Yeah. I'm reading it because it, it helps me to think in a more structured way about uh, good decision making. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the studying thing because I had a question for you. But I, I was when we were talking about sort of happiness, money, um, young, old, um, uh, Sepp Kambar, who we both know. Yeah, uh, brilliant he, guy. He did this massive study <clears throat> where he scraped all these blog posts about, like, and social media posts about what people were saying. I think the book is "I Feel Fine." This is like the result of the findings. But he was talking about how young people, when they say like "I feel happy." it tends to be followed with statements about accomplishments or activity. And as you get older, the statements drift steadily towards feelings of contentment or connectedness. Mm. And so uh, we can make a lot of decisions. It's like, we know objectively that's where we're gonna end up, that's what we're gonna care about, but then we spend most of our lives focusing on piling up accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I and sort of knowing I think that idea of thinking about what you're going to care about if you are lucky enough to be old, get old, is yeah. really important because it puts the things that feel important in perspective. Yeah, it it uh, Sepp's an, an amazing computer scientist. Yeah, and just a sweet heart of a totally. guy. Uh, and you know, this this observation that you just made right, that in younger years, let's just call it 20s and maybe 30s or, or early 30s, I am happy, I'm doing great because, and then accomplishment yeah. versus the contrast with connectedness and so on when older, raises a lot of interesting questions for me, right? So is it that independent of how well someone does professionally, that that shift exists, yeah. Or is it that those people who are being polled happen to be at say Stanford, where Seth has spent a lot of time? So no, people aren't being polled. This is oh, unsolicited this is, oh, this is from statements blog posts. that you okay. make uh, on social media. Okay, I got it. Yeah, so, yeah. so that that answers that. But these, like, to me, the it's important to me at least to immediately not be a cynic, but to ask a lot of questions so I understand the nature of what sure. is being implied. Right. Yeah. Because could it be that the people who experience or value connectedness in later years sort of paid their dues, cut, their, the cut their teeth, yeah. and therefore they're like, all right, I'm on my second home. Uh, I have checked off all these rungs on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Sure. Great. Now I can focus on yeah. you know, self-actualization. Uh, or does it happen independently? I think, I think it... If I had to place a bet, I would imagine that it probably happens somewhat independently as you become more aware of your mortality. Yes, I think and that's it, what it is. Uh, but the, uh, this is another facet that I think underscores how beneficial it is to, to study good investors, and that is, uh, or good scientists, but it's, it's, I think that investing has more sex appeal for a lot of people. Uh, the distinction between correlation and causation. Yeah. Right and, or is there a third? Is it possible there's a third or fourth factor yeah. that could be causal, uh, or at least highly correlated? Right. So you might see an observational study of some type where women who do yoga between the ages of this and this sure. report a higher level of well-being and yeah. lower blood pressure. Therefore, the headline in uh, some Huffington Post is yeah, yes. wherever. Right. Yes. Therefore. Uh, yoga decreases blood pressure. And stuff. Right. Wait a second. Where was this done? Yeah. It's like, oh, San Diego. Okay. Yeah. What's the median household income? Okay. What else are they doing? Oh, they're seeing, they have PPO sure. instead of HMO and they're seeing some of the best doctors in the country. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. 
and you begin to realize uh, how tricky it can be to establish a causation, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I don't find, at least the more I dig into this stuff, I find that more enriching and exciting than anything else. I know that it's frustrating because it means you can't rely on, say, most media reports of scientific findings or studies to be accurate and the claims that are extrapolated. But at the same time, to me, what it highlights is how much there is in plain sight that is really misunderstood. Yeah. And that's exciting for me because to me that says, op- that spells opportunity. If, if it's possible, for instance, and um, you know, there's some pretty good examples of this. I think that if you even look at, for instance, before we started recording, we are talking about the big short. Yeah. Right? If we look at some of these mortgage, like mortgage-backed securities, uh, short bets yeah. that ended up producing these multi-billion dollar windfalls, right. uh, some, of, some of those positions were based on uh, looking at publicly available data and drawing some pretty common sense conclusions. Right. Right? It wasn't well, we think, we AI, think... proprietary AI from you know, the, the Chinese government that was cracking this code. It was looking at what's right in front of certain people and seeing something different and also asking a lot of questions about incentives. Right. Right? Like if you ask a venture capitalist if things are going to turn south, it's... They are highly, 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 highly subconsciously or consciously sure. disincentivized from saying things are going to go south. Because Unless they have a large bet that things are going to go south. Which they would have to have yeah. uh, either outside of venture capital. Right, sure. So it wouldn't, be cor- it wouldn't be associated with their fund. Or they'd have to have some like counter-cyclical startup bet, which they may or may not. Right. Conversely, if you're looking at, say, hedge fund investors, and that's a term that's fallen out of favor, but... Yeah. Nonetheless, people who can place both long bets, we think this yeah. is going up or growing, and short bets, we think this is going down uh, or decreasing in value, their view of the world is going to be very different sure. and what they're willing to talk about. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I find it incredibly, uh, both really exciting and entirely terrifying that there are so many blind spots. Well, Tyler Cowen talks about this with the, the three-point revolution in the NBA. Like... Hmm. three-pointer has always been worth more than two-pointers. Right. And so you can miss a higher percentage of them and still score more points, mm-hmm. right? Like, so, yeah. so a, you know, a, a percentage making of a, of a three-pointer is on average worth more than a, what, uh, than a field goal, yeah. right? And it's like, literally, people were paid millions of dollars, million, billions of fans watch yeah, this game, yeah. and no one was like, hey, why don't we shoot more three-pointers? Right. You know, and, and yeah. then somebody did it. And the entire game changes. Yeah. I wonder who uh, that was. Like <clears throat> Steph Curry or someone comes in and But just... like that it was even, not just like within our lifetime, like it was within the last half decade yeah, yeah. That, that the game fundamentally changed. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not like they figured out the physics of shooting a three-pointer better. Like, yeah. just now there's incentives and so people shoot more three-pointers and they make more and the, a game literally that millions of people watch, just nobody noticed this thing right in front of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, or it's like you look at certain inventions, right? Wheels on luggage. Like, yeah, I've heard for you God, talking about this. For right? God's sake, yeah, you know? right. How long does that take? And it's 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 sitting there right in plain sight. Yeah, and uh, I think there are still, I mean, practically infinite number of opportunities like that. And for me, at least, it all comes from just a better set of questions. And um, if you look at the process behind or that has been developed at places like IDEO or Frog Design or these, these different product development industrial design firms, a lot of it's asking questions, right? Yeah. And uh, trying to not just test the assumptions, but find the assumptions, identify the assumptions in yeah. something like grocery cart design. Yeah. Right? Like, what have we just completely taken for granted because this is the way it is and this is the way it's always been? Yeah. And... Uh, I find that really exciting when it comes to, uh, it, and I like to try to ask a lot of those questions. Uh, there's a there's a great doc documentary called Objectified, yeah, which is about a lot of this. Uh, and then uh, I saw it a long time ago, made by the same filmmakers I believe who did a film called Helvetica. Sounds about, like a 
Tiger Manor, yeah. Yes, yeah, such a yeah. great dog. That brings up a lot of this. And when I see something that doesn't make sense or doesn't feel good, doesn't work well, uh, I like to ask a, a lot of questions and also combine that with studying incentives. Yeah. Like, is there any reason besides a design blind spot that there weren't wheels on luggage earlier. Like, is yeah. there some, is someone incentivized sure. in such a way that would make that, like, did that idea exist 30 years earlier, but it never came to fruition? And if so, why might that be the case? Okay, let's do that as a thought exercise. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for instance, I remember when Uber is a great example of this, right? I mean, I was involved with, with Uber before it was called Uber. It was Uber Cab LLC way back in the day in like 2008. Yeah. And uh, we'll just refer to it as Uber for simplicity was widely mocked. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was put on Angel List, which is another company I, I'm involved yeah. with, angel.co if people want to check it out. It was offered to investors and turned down, I want to say by hundreds of investors, as yeah. ludicrous. Yeah. And... The, the math behind some of the ridicule looked at the existing market for, I want to say, black sedan car services right. and limousines. And in that analysis, in retrospect, we can see there are a bunch of false assumptions. Right. Right. They thought it was always going to be high priced. Yeah. Where many things start out being prototyped among the privileged yeah. recycling yeah. another great example of that but then with scale prices go down it also assumed a relatively fixed market size it's like here's the existing market of of black sedan use we only see x percent of single digit growth yeah this is a shitty business because they'll right. never capture more than y percent right uh, missing the, the possibility uh, and ultimately the reality, which was that ride-sharing would create, ex expand that market exponentially sure. and create its own market, right? And uh, then you look at, let's just say, incentives of media coverage. Yeah. Right? Okay. At the time, and even more so now, it's in. It's very much in fashion to sort of attack anything sure. that seems like it's catering to the one percent, right? Even yeah. though it's really critical to prototype with people who are pro price insensitive in the early stages of a lot of product development, because sure, they if can you're, subsidize. If you're it. making yeah. one-offs, they're going to be fucking expensive. And uh, if you're testing things and there's, it, it's very rough around the edges. You can have these. Rich people, exactly, subsidize the product yeah. development that will ultimately lead to mass adoption. Yeah. So I find the whole thing just endlessly fascinating. Yeah. And I think it's it's also safe to assume that at almost any given point in time that almost everybody is getting it wrong. Um, yeah. With with many 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 things, uh, and that to me says that if if you just have because this is not an intrinsic capability that I have. This has been, if we're talking about it from an investment perspective or opportunity spotting perspective, it is absolutely something that I have honed over time. And there are many people much better than I am, but, but I've, I've, when I've found questions I like, I borrow those questions and I put them into an Evernote notebook yeah. under investing. Okay, I have these questions. When people point out misperceptions to me, and I'm like, holy shit, I totally missed that. How could I have missed that? I, right. write, I write those down. I'm like, wow, like, I completely, this never would have occurred to me now that they've said it. It's, it's entirely self-evident. Like, how, how did I miss that? Right? And why did they not, wait, why did they not miss it? Yeah. I really think about these things. And over time, you can develop this, this very learnable, skill of seeing things that other people don't see, which for me is mostly a byproduct of asking a lot of questions. Well, that, that actually ties into what I was going to talk to you about next. There's a quote I, in Ego's Anime. I, I have a quote from Bismarck where he says, like, any fool can learn by experience. I prefer to learn by <laughs> the experience of others. Right. And it, it seems like, like, so you're doing experiments, you're, you're, you're doing trials, you're, but you're also 
how you, it seems like that's one bucket of learning for you. Then the other bucket is like a network of smart people you ask lots of questions of. And then the third one is like you read widely and deeply yeah. from different kinds of books, from history, from philosophy, from psychology. So you're not spending 30 years of your life learning a lesson you could have learned on a $3 used Amazon purchase. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I much prefer to not make my own mistakes if I can yeah. avoid it, recognizing that, of course, I'm going to make all sorts of terrible mistakes. And to give, to give an example of the second category, yeah. learning from other people and how I might approach that, we can talk about something we were discussing very briefly before we started recording, which is right now uh, I've noticed and my team has noticed some kind of odd behavior when it comes to email deliverability and yeah. open rates. And we have, a, uh, by most measures, a large list, you know, 1.5 million or something like that for Five Bullet Friday in these various newsletters. And we, could, we have already looked on Google. We've already talked to some of the parties involved. But these parties have various incentives yeah. that may or may not be totally aligned sure. with ours. Uh, not to say they're in any way malicious or nefarious. It's sure. just different companies, different people, different parties in a different collaboration or transaction have different incentives. So I and my team have been putting together an email, a draft email to send to people like yourself. And it's, it's really five or six people I know already who have large lists yeah. to ask a handful of questions. But if I simply email all of you with a handful of questions, it's a very one-sided interaction, yeah. right? I'm asking someone to take time out of their day to help me with nothing in return. So what we've done is underneath each question, we are adding what we've tried, oh. right? Like here, yeah. here, are the, here are the three things we've already tried to address this. Here are the results, but we're still looking for more. What yeah. have you done or what would you do, right? Step one or question one, question two, question three, question four. And that could at some point turn into, we were joking earlier, the conversion cabal, yeah. registered trademark, I am funnel, here we go, I'm not gonna do that, but the, that could turn into some type of brain trust sure. with a handful of people who then exchange best practices, right? Yeah. Where everyone is currently, or most people are very siloed. Yeah. Right? So they're all trying to solve similar problems and have similar aspirations yet even though all the newsletters that I'm that I'm thinking of which are uh, owned by people like yourself and these other folks they're all non-competitive they're right. all in different areas with right. different demographics and it would make a lot of sense to have some information exchange and that will start the initial volley will be this email right yeah. where I'll share a bunch of stuff and we may or may not get replies I hope we get replies that would be an example of trying not to just make our own mistakes. No, I'm going tomorrow. I'm flying to Arizona and I'm meeting with five or six authors who you know. We go to this house in Sedona. Yeah. They've also, each one of us sold hundreds of thousands of books, best selling authors, and we just shoot the shit about stuff that's going on. We ask each other questions. Yeah. And you, you could even argue that some of us are competitive. I don't think books are competitive, but like the point is, like, why would we compete where we don't need to compete? Let's compete on, like, making great stuff. And let's yeah. get the other, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, I, that's what's been amazing for me with sports, um, watching these, like, coaches give book recommendations to mm. each other. Like, you'd think they would be competitive, but it's like, yeah. actually, they're getting the easy stuff out of the way, and then on Sunday, they're competing. Yeah. And so just, I think people can be really precious with information when actually you're almost always better sharing information. Yeah, and on top of that, uh, I can very safely give my playbook for almost anything right. to thousands of people, yeah. and uh, almost no one's going uh, I mean, right. to implement any of it. And that's not to say that prescriptive how-to stuff doesn't get used. It does, right. uh, particularly when it's simple, right? Like slow-carb diet for our body. Hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, right. have used this diet successfully. It's simple. It's easy to follow. Everyone is following a diet, yeah. whether they choose to or not. Sure. But when it comes to, say, launching a book, yeah. right, and I lay out this monstrous post 
because I got tired of answering these questions as one-offs, right? Yeah. Like how to, I think it's called how to publish a bestseller, how to, how to publish a best-selling book this year or something like that. How to write a best-selling book this year. I can't remember the exact yeah. title. But it's this monster compilation post of like everything you can imagine related to writing, prepping, titling, publishing versus self-publishing, marketing, PR, yeah. all of it. Yeah. Blurbs, you name it. Every stone is is turned. And people don't do it. Yeah. It, they're just like, no, I want the I want the silver bullet easy answer. You're like, can I hire someone to do that for me? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, no. This is that I mean maybe you can, but like this is my blueprint. Right. I've used it repeatedly. It works. But guess what? You still have to write a fucking good book. Right. And not to say my books are the best in the world, they're not. I mean, I mean, I would like to see they're. Very, I would like to think they're very useful, but I'm not Tolstoy. I recognize yeah. there are better writers out sure. there. Nonetheless, I take the vast majority of energy, and it goes into the writing. Yeah. Uh, but man, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty wild how how little adherence there is. Well, to go to that last bucket, maybe that's a place to wind up. Uh, what do you think about reading? Like, how do you find what you read? What's your methodology for breaking down books? Like, do mm -hmm. you, where do you get the knowledge that saves you painful trial and error? I very rarely read anything that isn't recommended to me by either someone I know is very selective and snobby about book choice. Yeah. Uh, like... Uh, say Naval Ravkant or my brother. Yeah. Uh, there are certain people who already have such a tight filter that anything, anything they read has passed a very high bar. Yeah. And anything they recommend has passed an even higher bar. Yeah. Uh, that is one way I get books referred to me that I take seriously. Another would would be triangulating multiple points of recommendation. And then uh, very often what I'll do is, let's just say I get a book recommended from uh, people on social media yeah. or readers or listeners. And I will prompt recommendations quite often by asking for yeah. the best books on a certain topic. And uh, perhaps a year ago or two years ago, I was very interested in learning more about the contemporary art world. Not just the artists, but the gallerists and yeah, the, whole industry. the entire industry, the market, the black box, all the craziness that, that goes into that. And this book called The $12 Million Stuffed Shark popped up repeatedly. Yeah. I was like, okay, let me take a look at that. And I looked at it, seemingly written by an economist. I go down then on Amazon, in this case, to the reviews I don't read the one-star reviews because they're like, I thought this was an Instapot. This yeah. is stupid. Well, you know. my, my, mine came damaged in the mail. Yeah, yeah. or it's just they, did, they yeah. clearly didn't read the description. They're like, this wasn't a novel at all. It's like, yeah, dummy, it's not a novel. So I, 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 I don't read the one-star. Yeah. I don't read the, uh, what is the highest, five stars? Yeah. I don't read the five stars. I will read the most helpful three and four star. Right. Because I, I already have the gestalt if, if the reviews are more than a few hundred reviews, I make the assumption that it is more or less reflective of the reality of the book. Yeah. Uh, Amazon reviews can very easily be gamed uh, on, a, on a smaller level, but most authors are not going to be right. motivated enough to do it over a long period of time. So I assume if, if there are hundreds of reviews, or even a hundred plus, and I look at them, and there are substantive reviews that the overall star, star ranking is a is a is a broad indicator yeah. of how much people have liked the book. Then I look at the most helpful uh, three and four star reviews because they will they will very often be say three paragraphs to two pages long, and they will really accurately lay out the structure of the book and like the strengths and weaknesses. Of sometimes they series. make you read the book better because you, yeah. it's, sometimes it spoils what's in the book, but yeah. then you actually understand it when you're reading it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do that. Uh, and if, 
if at that point I'm interested, I download it on Kindle. Yeah. I try to do almost all of my reading on Kindle, uh, which gives me the ability to highlight very easily. And then I can go to Notebook on Amazon or uh, use any number of other services to grab those highlights and look at them on laptop, put them into Evernote, whatever it might be. But before I get there, I will look at the most popular highlights. I will also look at Goodreads. Mm -hmm. I like looking at Goodreads for quotes from given books. If you don't like, if you don't love some of the quotes from the books, that's like hating the movie trailer and then going to see a three-hour movie. Right. You're not going to like the movie. Yeah. So I look at Goodreads, and uh, let's just say then I have the Kindle version. I will, uh, I'll read two chapters, three chapters, and if I don't, if I'm not really grabbed, if I don't want to take a photograph of some of the highlights and send it to a friend, I will consider stopping reading. Because life's too short. Life's too fucking short. At that, at, and uh, Tim Urban. Ha, of Wait But Why has so many great pieces and one is called The Tail End and he talks about the number of books he's likely to read in the rest of his life and it's a shockingly, frighteningly low Small number. number. yeah. Totally. So, I don't have enough time left in my life if we're assuming I'm going to die and I've looked at the the, the death ages uh, of my grandparents, great-grandparents, etc. Then I've like isolated the males I've looked at. Yeah. So there's a pretty decent chance I'll die somewhere between 80 and 85. Right? I'm 43. Yeah. There's not that much time left, mm-hmm. especially if you consider sort of cognitive decline and so yeah. on. Right? So I've got, let's just call it, who knows, you know, 20, yeah. 20 to 30 years left of, of like good book reading. You could also get hit by a bus. I could get hit by a bus. So all of that is to say, I don't have enough time to even read the classics I know the titles of. Right. Right. That I've heard of. Yeah. I don't have time for that. Right. I don't have time to read all of those. Sure. So the idea that I would pick up a book and, and think to myself, this is pretty mediocre and dedicate a week to reading it is pure insanity. So I, I drop a lot of books. When I looked at, and uh, I put up a blog post recently looking at everything I read in 2019, all the books and yeah. my favorite articles. And I included all the books I bought from Amazon. And I ended up completing somewhere between 30 and 40% of all the books that already made the cut to the right. point that I bought them. Sure, sure. Uh, and some of those I simply just never got around to, but a lot of them I, I stopped. I like the rule 100 pages minus your age. That's, that's the, the taste test? Yeah, that's when you quit. Oh, uh, okay. So, so as you get older, you become more ruthless. Yeah. As you get younger, right. you have to give it, because you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. As but a, no, I think people are, they're like, I paid for this. That, that's the sunk cost fallacy. They're like, I paid for this, I should finish it. It's like, yeah. you hate this book, so you're going to give it hours of your life, weeks of your life, yeah. just to prove that you could finish a David Foster Wallace book? I mean, like, come on. Yeah, and I was, you know, just thinking one way you could maybe trick yourself into making better decisions with books is to imagine that the book you're reading is someone you're having dinner with. Yeah. And it's like, would you really sign up for like five more dinners with this person? Right. If this is how you yeah. felt while you're reading it? Sure. No, you wouldn't. Right. And uh, the call that... You'd make up an excuse and you'd leave the dinner you're already at. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, books are also a great way to procrastinate sort of a socially validated way to procrastinate. So yeah. I try to be ruthlessly honest with myself about that. Interesting. I, I will, there are a lot of great books out there. Yeah. I could spend all day, every day reading great books yeah. and produce absolutely nothing of value. Yeah. So I, uh, have increasingly tried to block out time. I have less, I would say less and less time I dedicate to reading. And uh, I'm going to be publishing a post this week, which is a public pronouncement, which helps with setting policies for saying no, describing why I'm not going to read any new books in in 2020. So anything that is published in 2020. Oh, that's my my general rule is I almost always go towards older books. Um, Can I say one thing? Yeah. So I'm going to put out that post also to hold myself accountable. Right. 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 Because if I get caught then reading something new, it makes me look like a liar or a hypocrite. 
and I use public, oh, to public do the book I oh, I definitely don't don't won't, won't want to do those and don't want to do those. So this is a this is a single decision that makes as uh, Greg McEwen of Essentialism, which is a great book yeah. I recommend, would say not new anymore. So not new. Yeah, people can read it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic book. Uh, looking for the single decisions that remove hundreds of decisions. Right. So not reading any books in 2020 removes a lot of decisions. Someone says, oh my God, you should read this book. It's new. Sorry, I can't do it. Right. Right. It, it preserves so much of my cognitive decision making bandwidth and energy for other things to make that one public. And for me, public is to a large audience, but for um, in other areas of my life, I make public commitments to one or two or three friends or right. to my girlfriend so that they can hold me accountable. Sure. And uh, I, I find great value in that. If you're trying to guard against your lesser self, I find that really useful. No, and I think, I think with, it's like, so the, the cost of a book is financial, primarily time, and then what you're going to put in your brain. I don't want to read things that are going to be subsequently or very quickly proven irrelevant yeah. or proven, you know, uh, incorrect or out of fashion. Like, You'd be better off sitting down and reading uh, Shakespeare's plays because that is that has not only had five hundred years of cultural impact, yep. but will probably have five hundred more years of cultural impact. So, like, I think to, looking at the half life of information and deciding to consume information that's likely to remain true over time, it forces you to be both more general but also more timeless. Meanwhile, if you read a book about the first year of the Trump presidency. Or, or how many books, it, like like uh, a couple years ago or a year or so ago, somebody wrote a book about Uber and then like the founder was fired shortly after the book came. It's like that book is, the guy who finished that book wasted his time because it's already irrelevant by subsequent events. And I think we have a newness bias that yeah. prevents us from accumulating wisdom where we could be finding it. Yeah. I, uh, I'm more interested these days in the pieces of the puzzle and by the puzzle we could be talking about anything right sure. we could be talking about human behavior we could be talking about the the rise and fall of nations yeah. that are kind of like the tectonic plates sure right? i'm more interested in those because there's a bit more certainty and a higher degree of confidence in uh, identifying and understanding some of those elements, right? Yeah. If they've been shown over and over again throughout history, or proven, or uh, I suppose based on what I said earlier, um, you know, shown to be very likely repeatedly in in science. Right? Yeah. So this all makes me think of this uh, quote by I'm thinking I'm getting the name right, Donald Knuth, K N U T H, who was at, I want to say, IBM. Might be IBM, but it doesn't really matter. The point being, he stopped using email at one point. Yeah. Completely stopped. And he said, for, you know, for, for people who want to stay on top of things, email is great. He's like, but, but I want to get to the bottom of things. Ooh. And I've thought about that a lot. Yeah. Because keeping on top of things is a losing game. Yeah. It's just by definition. Yeah, it's new a, stuff's happening. It's a losing game and there are people who are going to be more dedicated and obsessive with current affairs. I have no competitive advantage. I have no information advantage. Well, I, have so, I actually have a lot yeah. of information advantage, but I have no desire or behavioral advantage with current events. Right. And it also breeds sort of emotionally and physically uh a life driven by cortisol and FOMO and so on. Whereas if I'm able to discipline myself enough, which I partially do through this public accountability, to focus on studying things that have endured, uh, I just feel much better in life in sure. general and I make better decisions. Yeah, look, the, they didn't have the news 250 years ago. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They did yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They did fine. Yeah, they did just fine. So, oh man. Yeah, the news. 
happy to miss the news. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I'd rather have a truth than trivia. Yeah. So, Ryan, I suppose this is the time when we say goodbye. Yep. Tearful, tearful, stoic holiday goodbye. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you online, learn more about you, and what would you like to tell people about your current projects? Uh, yeah, maybe check out Daily Stoic, which is a stoicism-inspired email each morning. Um, also at Daily Stoic on most platforms. And then I'm Ryan Holiday, pretty much any bookstore. Across the socials and across That's the bookstores. That's true, yes. Is there any, if people look at your selection of books and think to themselves, I don't know where to start, yeah. where would you suggest people start with your writing? It's a good question. Um, I'd start with The Obstacle is the Way or Stillness is the Key. It, it, depending, it's like if you're going through something tough, I'd start with The Obstacle is the Way. If you're maybe dealing with some of the stuff we're talking about, which is sort of life optimization, what do I want, how do I manage, maybe I'd do stillness. All right. Yeah. And there you have it, folks. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. And uh, as those listening probably know, this is Tim Ferriss signing off for now. Thank you for listening. And until next time, experiment well, experiment widely, and test those assumptions.